Hello, and welcome to an installment of the FIT Soul Club Oral History Project, a project at Fashion Institute of Technology, one of the 64 uh, institutions that comprise the State University of New York. This project is generously funded uh, by FIT President Dr. Joyce F. Brown through her Diversity Grant Program Initiative and through the wonderful efforts of the Gladys Marcus Library, Andrea Klein, Cataloging Associate, as well as Karen Trivet, Associate Professor and Head of the Special Collections and College Archives. I am Tor Orange, Director of the Office of Educational Opportunity Programs at FIT. The Soul Club of FIT was created and organized by a member of the FIT community, Ms. Clara Branch, in 1968 following the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. The resulting interview will be made available via the FIT Library's website platform, Archive On Demand. The digital file and its transcription will become part of the official college archives. The library's unit of special collections and college archives administers the FIT oral history programs. We are coming to you today from the FIT campus on West 27th Street in Manhattan, New York City. And it is November 30th. The time is 11.10 a.m. We have the honor and privilege to be joined today by Adrian Jones. Adrian Jones. And we will have an opportunity to hear just who Ms. Jones is and what her role was with regard to the Soul Club fashion show, uh, the Soul Club itself, and the presence really at FIT. So welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. Absolutely. So we have interviewed um, a few people. Okay. We'll be interviewing many more. Uh, and almost to a person, when they've heard your name, they have said, oh, Adrian, my BFF. Oh, Adrian, my BFF. Uh, and also as someone who was really central to the Soul Club and the Soul Club fashion show. So I'd like to invite you to share with us a little bit about who you are. We'll be doing that for a minute or so. But we also want to hear about who you were in relationship to Clara Branch and to the Soul Club Fashion Show. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's <laughs> yes. a lot. Uh, so who am I? I'm an artist. Uh, and under that umbrella, I'm a clothing designer. I'm a professor at Pratt Institute. Of course, I'm an FIT alum. Uh, I'm a painter. Uh, I've curated and co-curated an exhibit. I'm working on being a writer. Okay, that's it for today. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you everyone's BFF? I don't know. Um, Steve Cutting, I mean, Davis, uh, Karen Rippey, on and on. Who were you here at FIT? Um, I was a lot of fun. I. Um, it was just such an exciting time being here. And my mom always said to me, wherever you go, make a friend. Mm. So mm. I made lots of friends. <laughs> and uh, the blessing to that is I've kept them close to me all this time. Say a little bit about the timeline. Uh, when were you here? I got and from where? where? Are you in New York? Um, I'm, I'm from New York. I live in Westchester. I got here. Uh, right after high school, so I jumped right in. The difference was there were a lot of people who had gone to fashion industries who had more of a fashion background than I did. I came from a different space. Um, my mother always said she believed I painted my way out of the womb, <laughs> but I came up during a time of the standardized testing mm -hmm. and so once they tested me and they were like, this little girl is really bright. And there's also a little more history on that. Um, I was one of the first children who was bused to school. I lived in New Rochelle and New Rochelle was the first uh, city in the Northeast that was federally mandated to segregate. 
So to desegregate. To desegregate, sorry. I, got you. Um, I just knew I was going to school and I was excited about going to school. I really just found out about this history maybe five years ago. Um, and there's there's sidebar, sidebar. There's a uh, woman who's actually done a documentary on that. So once once they said, okay, she's she's smart. We gotta we gotta work with this somehow. Um, they put me in a lot of advanced courses. By the time I got to high school, um, they were all pre college courses. And a lot of the art classes were substituted with, I won't even say substituted, were taken away in, in place of, you know, higher learning courses, um, which I did very well in. But the best thing that happened out of that experience was to find out that the art was still there. The creativity was still there. It never mm. left me. Mm. It was just mm. waiting waiting for me to come back. Um, so when it came time to choose school, always been interested in psychology and how the brain works or how it doesn't work. Um, art was never left out of that. And then I, one of my favorite teachers in high school uh, I was also her favorite student, so she was like, "Well, you're going to school for writing. I've, I've, I want you to apply to Brown." I was like, "Hmm, what would I do there?" <laughs> <laughs> and I had applied to so many different colleges for so many different things, and my um, my guidance counselor she says, "Okay, Adrian, listen, listen, what do you love to do?" And that was an easy answer. That was an easy answer. Um, my mother had this very wonderful, amazing woman who had an atelier in Harlem. And my mother was her muse. And she made these beautiful clothes. Um, she died. And for whatever reason, left me her sewing machine. So on top of everything else I did, I tinker a lot. So... I took the entire machine apart, put it back together, mm. and that's how I learned to sew. Mm. So I'm learning last, the functionality learning of Learning the of functionality the of the machine. Mm. And so my junior, senior year in high school, I just made all these crazy clothes. And you're still in, you, at that time, you're still in Westchester. Mm-hmm. I still live there now, yeah. And um, so I said, well... I like to sew and I like to dance. So she said, that's it, you're going to FIT. I had never heard of FIT. I was like, she, you're sending me to a school for physical fitness? Shh, she didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> she did not say I that. I lived in the burbs that. and they had distracted me from <laughs> not just what the I did. New Rochelle. New Rochelle, okay. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, we'll give it a try. And she said, just, she said, just draw some stuff. And that was really the first time um, since middle school that somebody said to me, just do what you do. And I created a portfolio. I personally didn't think it was that great. Mm -hmm. And um, I brought in some of the gowns that I had made for my mom. And they said, you're in. Okay. Timeline. What Timeline, years? 77. Mm -hmm. uh, so I show up and there's all these amazing, mm -hmm. fabulous people. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to jump in. I'm I don't, like I don't know. I don't know where I fit, but I'm going to jump mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that first semester was so hard because there were, like I said, other people came in with some type of, fashion design background, and I didn't. Uh, but the blessing is that I have a photographic memory. So you show me something and, mm. okay, got it. I'll do it. I'll do it. The other pressure was I was the first one in my family to go to college. 
So I was feeling a lot of pressure to just be mm -hmm. wonderful, mm -hmm. you know, and, and be, be the best I could be. My mother always, my parents were always supportive of me being their different child. They were like, we don't know where she came from. But give her <laughs> what work she, with her. <laughs> give her what she needs to do what she's going to do. Um, and at the end of the semester, I almost felt like I was going to leave. And I never, this is probably the first time I've ever talked about it. And, and I said, no, you know what? Let's try something different. Instead of going to school for mom and dad, let's try going to school for yourself. Mm -hmm. So that next semester, I came back with a whole different attitude and just did it. And delivered. And just did it. Fashion design? Fashion was design major. was my major. Yeah. Who was here then? Do you remember any of your professors? Oh, yes. Professors and Professor Harrigan, mm -hmm. Professor Paul. Uh, Professor Paul had been the assistant to Pauline Schreger. Mm. Uh, so I had mm. him for tailoring. And he was so hard on me. And I remember the first, I still remember the first project he had us do was in stripes. And I got this crazy idea. I'm going to take red and white stripes of every size that I can find in fabric. And I'm going to put them all together in one dress. Mm. So I did that. And I'm mm. just like, I'm so happy. And I got, um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just zooming through this. And I was the first one in the class finished. So I'm excited. It's the first critique. And he comes over and he says, it's a B plus. And, and my chest just caved in. <laughs> but, but, and he says, he pointed to the top of the dress. And he says, the stripes were off by an eighth of an inch. Mm. So I went in the bathroom and pulled myself together. And I was like, well, that's never going to happen again. again. <laughs> and at least again. it won't be by an eighth. <laughs> and it, I, could, I could tell you an, a measurement of an eighth of an inch from across the room. Mm -hmm. And when I left his class, his, our last critique, um, I had done a suit. A suit dress. It was a dress with a jacket and a leather inlay. And um, he was going, you know, past everybody's stuff. And we were sweating. We thought we were going to die that day. He was probably one of the most toughest teachers I've ever had. But he knew his, well, all of my professors, they really knew their mm -hmm. stuff. And um, he was walking by everybody and, and giving them, giving them hell. And he just walked by me. And I was, I was as devastated as I was the first time. Feeling ignored or right. marginalized. And I said, but Mr. Paul. And he says, oh, I gave you an A three weeks ago. Ah. And I was like, but can you still come yell at me <laughs> if you talk to me? So. Two yeah. years at that flight, two or four? I did two years. Um, they were just getting ready to start the four-year program. Mm. And I had Professor Harrigan for my uh, senior collection. And she had a whole different view for me. She says, listen, right now, the program wasn't that well developed. And she says, and I don't want you here stuck and getting bored. She said, because you do that very easily. Mm -hmm. And her thought was, um, one of my best friends, she's still my best friend, she's Godmother to my child, mm. Jerry, uh, Jerry Lewis, shout out. <laughs> um, she wanted us to, this is where the modeling came in at. She wanted us to go to Paris and model. To model. And she says, and you'll go over there and you'll make all these connections. <clears throat> then you come back here and design. I was so insulted by that. And I didn't really understand what she was saying and why that would have been absolutely a, absolutely. a working way of way of, yes yes and I couldn't I couldn't hear it neither one of us could so we were just like no we're staying here we're going to be these great designers and like I said it was it was years later that I got it and I understood it interesting. At what point the soul club? So 
The Soul Club was very interesting. Um, there was also a model club. I was not interested in any of it. I was here to learn how to make the best clothes ever so I could dress everybody in the world. And I had a friend at the time and she wanted to try out for the, um, for the model club, separate from the soul club. And I was like, oh my God, can we just go and eat lunch? And she's, well, come with me, come with me. All right, I'll come. Won't go into the details, but I got chosen and she didn't. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so, um, so I had been with that for maybe a couple of months and then I heard about the Soul Club. Now I knew about the club <clears throat> because Miss Branch had a huge office space um, where you could go and get supplies. Yes. It was like a the giant resource, resource room, room. Exactly. right? Fabrics. And fabrics, books, everything. And also when you were in there, it was a club within a club because you got to see the people that you didn't normally see because you were in class all day and all night. So it was a great place to go in there and see other students from other disciplines. Mm. Um, so I'm in there one day getting books. I'm, I'm a nerd and I own it and I love it and I live <laughs> it. So I was always looking at the different books she had. So I would get the books that I needed for class. And then I would get the books that I just needed to, read. to feed, to feed yes. all of this. And so one day she said to me, she said, <laughs> she says, we're having tryouts for the fashion show and you need to be there. That's <laughs> just how she said it. And I was like, <laughs> and I call her my branch. Uh, she was not somebody that you said no to. <laughs> I, di I didn't want to, but I was like, oh, okay, okay. And um, that was really my first interaction with her. She was like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. Mm. So the room was divided. Mm. There was a wall and her office space was on this side. And then all the supplies that you needed were on this side. Mm -hmm. So you would hear her because sometimes she would be yelling at somebody to get something right, but you didn't see her that often. And so when she came from behind the curtain, it was the wizard. It was, <laughs> it was the wizard. <clears throat> and what she said, you just did. You just did. How long did you participate? She told me I could not stop until she retired. <laughs> and, and you held to that. <laughs> and I, I didn't have an option. <clears throat> I didn't have an option. By that time, we had developed such an amazing relationship. Mm. Um, mm. She, she didn't have any children of her own. Mm. So the children of the Soul Club were her kids. Were, were her kids. Um, ours developed into so much more. Her and I share the same birthday. Mm. And um, my mother's birthday was 10 days after that. Mm. And my mother and Jerry's mother would come to every, every, show. every show and sit next to each other. And um, so <clears throat> they developed a relationship. And um, I, I don't even know when it happened. Um, probably at one of our lunches because we would do, we would do our birthday lunch together. And then <clears throat> it was myself, Jerry, Pam Talley. I want to say there were a few other people and um, she was very particular about her circle. That circle was very, very tight. And uh, then we would go to lunch. And I believe it was at one of our birthday lunches. And she said, you know what? She says, I've never had a godchild. Mm. I think you should be. It was really just that simple. Mm. And again, not, not ever knowing how to say, no, I'm not doing that. Mm. You just said, okay. And okay. so she claimed you. And she, 
<clears throat> she claimed me. She was my son's bonus grandmother. Like she was in my life. Um, outside of the Soul Club, she, when, when I made the transition from working in the industry to teaching, she was my guiding force. Mm-hmm. Um, I know she did not have an easy time, if you just think of the times that she was here. Um, and, and I'll just say it, she, she didn't get the accolades that she deserved when she was here. By the institution. By the institution. Because the students, I came in 82. Oh. And already I knew of Clara Branch. Right. And every student of color. Right. Reference Clara Brand. Yeah, you d- you didn't do FIT without her. Without, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But institute wise, I know she had a lot of struggles. Mm-hmm. She didn't get the um, advancements that she should have got as because she was she also taught here. Oh, and she, she, in fact, share some what you know about her because uh, there's always a sense of mystery around Clara Branch. People knew who the public. You know Clara why? Branch because that's how show. that's how she wanted it. How she lived her life. That's how she wanted it. What she did at FIT was very separate from what she did when she was not at FIT. And she she taught me that, you know. Um and and her and my mom because it was almost for me she was a bonus mom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And but having gone through the the system uh, she knew things and she could tell me things mm-hmm. and she could share things with me. And I know that without that knowledge that she gave me, I would have not known to fight the way I had to fight for my position at Pratt. For for the sake of the viewers, it's worth noting that she was at FIT uh, during Marvin Feldman's administration. Yes. Yeah, yes. because he was a big force as well, a big yes. personality man from industry. It was like everybody here was larger than life, yes. including the student body. You know, um, I remember we used to keep, well, I used to keep um, a garment that was for a black tie event and a champagne flute that I took <laughs> from one of the black tie events. As a student? As a student. <laughs> And whenever they had something going on here, because it was always something going on right, at the FIT. Trustees were always here. So I would run to a friend's dorm room, dress up, make up, and put my little outfit on. And, and we ready. would call it going in the door backwards with your champagne flute. So it would look like you had already been there and been invited. <laughs> Did that countless times. <laughs> but um, who was she? She was, she was a very strong and secure woman, but I grew up with that. That's, that's the woman my mother was. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the man my dad was. But at a time where it wasn't acceptable. Mm-hmm. Like my parents are, were always older than my friend's parents. Um, and so I know that they had been through a lot and didn't always talk about it. And didn't that was yeah. that was yeah. that time. So I saw them as these very um royal people who you knew they had scars, mm-hmm. but they didn't show them. And they didn't allow what had happened to them in the past to get away to get in the way of where they wanted to be and where they wanted to go. And they definitely did not um, have that for their children. Mm-hmm. Um, especially now that I know the history of what was going on in New Rochelle when I first started school, I recognize what my parents did to shield and protect me from racism. Like, I had no idea that there were people in the world who didn't like you or treated you poorly simply because because of the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. As a kid, 
that never made sense to me. As an adult, it still doesn't make sense to me. Um, so they protected and shield me, but also slip lessons in there. Like mm -hmm. it's very important mm -hmm. that you know that we've got you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and that was something that carried that has carried me through my entire career. And I am very thankful for mom and dad and my branch. Mm -hmm. Because those are the three that let me know whatever it is that you want, you're probably going to have to fight for it. But it's there to be claimed. But it's there to be claimed. You can, ha you can have it. You yeah. can have it. Yeah. I had a similar experience um, growing up. I used to say that the women in my family always moved laterally. Meaning if they encountered any kind of challenges, um, they would very astutely move left and they'd move right, but they weren't moving back. Right. They didn't go backwards. <laughs> that wasn't even on the table. That wasn't on the table. Now they that might was not move on the left table. or right out of the range of danger, but they weren't moving backwards. And I think that's a, a, a wonderful way of viewing life um, yes. when there's hardship. Because yes. Because you can't always duck hardship. Right. But can't. they also taught me how to jump. Mm. Mm. So I could shift from mm -hmm. left to right, mm -hmm. but I also could jump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Clara Branch from a New Yorker from the South. Harlem. Where was she? Was born in her parent. I don't was remember she? where her parents were from, but they had been Harlemites. The apartment that she lived in was originally her parents' apartment. Mm. And she lived in Harlem. I know that she and Betty Harris Merritt. Yes. Remember, we're very, very close friends. Yes, and don't leave out Georgette Giddens. Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. yes, who I still, like, she knows I'm here today. She knows I'm here today. Yeah, yeah. And they would travel together. Um, I, I got the opportunity to see her when she didn't have to be tough, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know, cause yeah. that's, that's a way that's hard. It's, it's, it's hard to do that every single day. Yes. And, and I know that because I've lived it also mm -hmm. being in higher education. Um, now was she from industry? Or yes, she, she was, was from, she was from industry. Okay. okay. And it's funny that you say that because I just remembered. So you've heard about the scrapbooks. You've heard about the scrapbook, but she also, and I just remembered it this moment, she also gave me a book of sketches that she had done when she worked for this dress company. Mm. Mm. And I was like, how did you forget that? Yeah, mm. that, that's in my library. Yeah. That's a real bequeathing. Yes. 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 Mm. Mm. The, the fashion show itself, any, uh, share with us when you are aware that it actually came into being, what was its purpose? We, we've certainly heard that it was a platform for students of color. It was. Design. So it started before I got, before I got there and it was just the club. It okay. was the club and it was the availability for students of color to get supplies that they needed. I'm, I don't. I want to say the fashion show started in the 70s. I only know uh -huh. about that because I've gone through the scrapbooks and she had, from every show documented. that they did, she had it documented. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a way for the students to show their work and not having to wait until, you know, your senior, your senior show. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was outside of that. But I can say hands down, and this was some of the competition that the soul shows were hands down the best shows that were produced during that time. Mm. Because she had compared to what the what the what campus what was the campus was doing. For the and I don't shows. think you'll find anybody that was here that will tell you any different black, white, or green. Um she had such an amazing group of people that not only loved her, but believed in her, um, who worked backstage with her. And mm -hmm. some of these people were from FIT, 
many of the people were from the industry. Mm. So the man, and I cannot recall his name right now, who helped produce the show. Leland he, No, not Leland. Lotus? There was Lotus? Lo, Leland and Lotus were both okay. in there, but this was this even this was somebody oh, else. No, okay. no, 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 no. These were all together. I mean, she had she had an army. She had a real army. This was a white gentleman, and he produced most of the Seventh Avenue fashion shows. That's who he was. Okay. Um, so she had lighting people. She whatever she needed, people stepped up. And this was all volunteer. Nobody, mm. nobody mm. got paid. There mm. was there was not mm. that budget. The mm. budget went to the books and the supplies for the students. So she had these amazing people that worked in the industry come in and say, yeah, we're going to help you do this. It's amazing the goodwill that she must have garnered in order, as you say, for people to volunteer. Their but time. she that's who she was. She was yeah. this amazing woman and she either liked you or she didn't. It was <laughs> clear. There was no <laughs> Clara was clear, very clear. And the thing about not liking you, you would have had to done something to get on that side of her because mm -hmm. she was open and, and welcoming and welcoming to, to everybody. Mm -hmm. And she could show that professionally. Personally, mm -hmm. it was a whole different, it was a whole different kind of love. And, and I'm honored to have experienced that. Share with the viewers, if you would, um, something that they might not normally learn or know about her, about Clara Branch. What they would She's know. legendary now. What's the, what so lots know. has been passed on. What do you think most people who claim to have known her or did know her really didn't know? She was a caretaker for her mom. Mm. Um, this is probably getting ahead of the story, but it's a part of the story. The women in the family, she had a she had an older sister, and they all developed Alzheimer's. Mm. And so her mm. mother, she never put her mother in a nursing home. If she had to go to the hospital, she would go to the hospital and she mm. would bring her back home. And she cared for her until the day she left here. And I knew how much that meant to her because she would share her with me. Mm. So I was, I, I could go into the bedroom and, and by this time she was nonverbal, you know, but she would say, you know, talk to her. And hadn't connected the dots yet, but having that experience with her mom you. taught me how to be with her. Okay, I feel like tissues are going to be necessary if I have mm -hmm. to start talking about that. Um, it was only maybe four or five years after her mom passed that she started developing symptoms. Mm -hmm. And again, another day that I will not forget, we were on the phone and she... She always sent me cards, my son and I. She, when he was going back to school, she would send him a card with a hundred dollars in it, you know. So we always had cards, and she was she was getting preparing to send me something, and she says, "What's your address again?" And I told her address, and we would have conversation for another two minutes, and then she would say, "What's your address again?" As if she had not asked me that, and I kept. I would keep answering her. I, I, I never said, um, you just told me, you that. Just told me that. And I said, Ma, you know what? I'm going to send you a card. And I'll put my address on the outside of the envelope and I'll put it real big on the inside of the envelope. Um, and when I hung up the phone, I cried. I cried. But so you didn't ask me this question. But I'm going to throw it in there to show you the, who she was. Uh, one of the questions that was on the sheet you gave me was, what did you want to be when you grew up? 
And um, I laughed at it when I when I came in the room because I never wanted to grow up. <laughs> I thought, I guess that's very that much Peter, <laughs> Peter Pan um, because my parents gave me such a loving, magical childhood. Like I would stop everything and do it all over again. Mm-hmm. And so I just never thought about being older, being grown up. Like, what is that? What is that? I believed in Santa Claus till I was about 12 <laughs> because they made Christmas such a magical thing. And Clara was very much like that. Mm-hmm. So I got to keep my childhood. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, people talk about their inner child. No, mine is out and about <laughs> all of the time. I have to reel her back in. And Clara had this very childlike side to her, mm. which was very different from the public, the public side. Mm. She loved Charlie Brown. She loved Peanuts. Mm. She loved watching cartoons. She mm. had a collection of videotapes. And most of the time she didn't watch, you know, commercial TV. She would pop in a tape. <laughs> And she loved the old black and white movies, which she shared with me. She taught me about different actors and actresses. And she loved Betty Davis. She was like, if you want to know how to be a bitch, (laughs) you got to watch. And And a badass one. And a badass. Yeah. yeah, Right. I mean, if you want to be a badass one. Right. Because she could just say something to you. And it's funny because... She had, you know, she would tell me, no, watch this movie, watch this movie and watch it come out. And I was like, wow, she just she just cut them from ear to ear and they don't even realize, you know, you take five steps and then you're like, (laughs) what just happened? And. So I got to see and share that side. So for Christmas, every single year, Macy's used to have a different Snoopy. And every year she was there. I would buy I, I would buy her. That was my Christmas present to her. Mm-hmm. I would buy her another Snoopy. And she had a collection of Snoopies that was just amazing. You know, it makes me wonder if that side of her was compensating for maybe some harder times. I don't when doubt she that. Was young. I don't doubt that at all. Mm-hmm. I don't doubt that at all. But she allowed herself to be free and happy and childlike when she was away from work. And I know she had a very close relationship with her mom and dad. Like I said, she lived in that apartment. Mm -hmm. Um, And her sister, you know, Mm -hmm. it was just the two. It was just the two of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she loved to travel. You know, like I said, she would pick up, she would pick up her girls, Miss Betty, Miss Georgie, and <laughs> and loved to go to Atlantic City. Loved, loved, loved. Thelma and Louise plus one. Plus one. And the plus one could change depending yes, on yes. who was doing what. Yes. Yes. Yeah. How long was she at the college? Oh. I was fortunate to have her the entire time I was here, but I don't I don't know when she started. I know she came out of fashion industries oh, and then she? she worked in the industry. She um, began at the high school? No, no, no. I know she was a I think she was a student there. Oh, oh, oh. I think she was a student gotcha. there. But I don't know exactly when she started here. I know again when I came in 82, she was already here. Mm-hmm. And she was here when you were here in yes, 70. In 77. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And uh-huh. she was here before that. Uh-huh. You know, she she had a legacy. Mm-hmm. There should be a plug plug. There should be at least part of FIT that is named after her. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Say it louder. There should be, let's look right in the camera. There Say should be somewhere here on this campus with Clara Branch's name attached to it. Mm. Mm. Said it. Talking into being. That's right. Yeah. That's right. 
What else would you want us to know about him? I th I think I've I can I can hear her telling me you wasn't supposed to say that. Right, me. She's probably saying shh. Right. Stop now. Right. Right. <laughs> like you say another word, and I'm I'm coming after you sometime today. Um, because she was private. She was very private, and um, as she got older, it was just three of us that she allowed to come and have lunch with, and that was Jerry, myself, and Pam Talley. Uh, Pam modeled. Pam was this fabulous model with these fabulous legs. Um, and then, you know, life goes on and people go on, and a lot of times it was just her and I, mm. you know, and, and my son. Mm. Mm. What an honor. Yes. What an honor. Yes. And I, I, I carry that. I carry that with me. I don't, there's not a day that I know that, you know, she's, she's not here with me and guiding me through, like I said, you know, the left, the right, and the jumps. A last question, um, at least on my, my end. Do you think in this day and age that the Soul Club fashion show, um, sort of the model of it, is applicable or have times changed? Was there something unique about the period during which she was here at FIT that made it so successful? Or have young people changed? Have the times changed? Or is it possible? All right. So that first part of the question, um, I think it was what it became to be because of the time that we were in. Um, the, the other thing that was huge during the time I was here was the onset of AIDS. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. when I was here, yes. Yes. Um, it didn't even have a name yet. Right. And then the other big thing was uh, the kidnapping of Aton Pates. Mm, from Soho. Yes. So, just a little bit because the viewers may not be familiar okay, with Okay, so... Whatever year it was, all of a sudden, this little, he was somewhere between six and eight years old. If, if that, I think he was and, like about six. And um, he lived with his parents in Soho. And one day he went to school to walk to the bus and um, was never seen again. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was startling for me because I knew how much my parents took care of me and protected me. And to think that there was this little boy out there mm -hmm. that had been taken from his parents. Um, and that, that stayed with us because they never found him. Yeah, yeah. They if, never found him. decade or so, they, but I remember, they found someone. Who right, was, right. It was an adult version of him, but. No. And I remember going, um, I was in lower Manhattan shopping for leather or something and seeing these, Posters. posters all around. It was scary. It was scary because, you know, you grow up and you're taught, don't talk to strangers, but who was a stranger? You know, you knew everybody in your community. You knew everybody in the neighborhood. So there was not the fear. Like now you, you have to teach your kids, you know, children are being snatched. Adults are being snatched. Um, but that, that wasn't happening then. And then with the onset of AIDS, people who you knew and you were friends with just suddenly disappeared. There was no, there was no real notification that, I think I knew of one person that it was specified during that time that he had died from AIDS. Everyone else, it was, it was, a, it was like a secret. Mm -hmm. You know, if you- And was, a source of shame. And a source of shame. You didn't yes. want anybody to know. It was definitely at that time a uh, gay male mm -hmm. disease. Um, and that put another spin on your outlook on life. So all of that and um, racism was, well, it hasn't gone anywhere. So it definitely 
didn't hide during that time. So I think all of that built that community. And those fashion shows, if you didn't get your tickets, and I think tickets were like five, ten dollars at most. If you didn't get your tickets, you couldn't get in. The shows were packed every single time. Um, and I can verify that because <laughs> one year I couldn't get in, no and matter what I did. It was it was a big deal. We yeah. were like these, you know, these little little celebrities. Celebrity wasn't a big deal at that time, and. Um, and she kept us all in check so that it didn't become a head game for us. And then in the 80s, we got the opportunity to travel. We took the show on the road. We went to D.C. We went to Philly. Um, I, well, like I said, she told me I couldn't stop until she stopped. So um, my son was born in October of 85. I modeled until. August of 85, mm. belly and all, mm. <laughs> you know, she's like, so much you're pregnant. We have clothes for you. <laughs> Pre Rihanna. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so, so is that to say that you think that that moment has come and gone? It was a special time. It was or a very special time. It could happen now. I know after she retired, um, there was a woman who said she was going to, to pick up and do the show. And I think she had no idea the amount of support that my branch had. And- um, Was that Rhonda stuff? Yes, that was yeah. Rhonda. Yeah. And I think she did it for maybe about two years, but it was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And without that support that Clara had, I didn't see how anyone was going to be able to do that, you know, and she didn't have, um, she didn't have the resources. I think that was mm -hmm. the main issue. She didn't have the resources mm -hmm. and people, you know, had started moving on and doing their own thing. So to do it now, I will never say it can't be done, but it's not a simple formula. It is not a simple formula. It is not a simple formula. And and I, in a very small way, um, took what she left in me of the Soul Club and of the Soul Fashion Shows um, to start the Black Dress Project. And because that was another thing that that show did, it exposed people to Black creatives, to Black designers, mm. which... You know, unless you knew somebody, you know, there was Willie Smith at the time. Mm -hmm. um, there was Stephen Burroughs. But there wasn't a lot of people, designers who looked like us, who had who had made it, mm -hmm. you know. And so one of those scrapbooks, uh, because of her, I thought I had quite a knowledge of designers. And going through those scrapbooks, I was like, wait, I don't know half of these people. And that was a learning lesson for me. And I had seen the scrapbooks long before she had passed. So I knew when I went to her home exactly what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so my thought was, I need, to, I need to give this back. I need to give this back in some way, somehow. And um, it, it became a visual dialogue for the lack of diversity in the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my tribute. That is my tribute to Clara Brand. Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been wonderful. Thank you.